Poseidon mission of Bernard Delphont, we send to the forces overseas this recorded radio version of the current London radio stage success, Old Chelsea. Those taking part are Richard Tauber as Jacob Bray, a professor of philosophy, Carol Lynn as Mary Fenton, a milliner, Nancy Brown as Nancy Gibbs, an opera singer, Betty Percheron as Christine, Charles Hawtrey as Peter Crawley, Mayor O'Neill as Mistress Murphy, Jacob Bray's housekeeper, Francis Robert as Lord Ranelagh, Ward Morgan as Sir Percy, Elizabeth Aveling as Lady Wargrave, C. Jarvis Walter as Sir Roger, and Esther Moncrief as the Countess of Stafford. Book by Walter Ellis, music by Richard Tarber, additional numbers by Bernard Grun, with lyrics by Fred S. Tisch and Walter Ellis. The commentary is by Edward Sterling. The orchestra under the direction of Serge Krish and production by Edward Sterling and Jonah Barrington. Imagine yourselves for a moment in a sunny, flower-bedecked courtyard overlooking the Thames in old Chelsea at the end of the 18th century. On one side of the courtyard, it's bounded by two charming houses in which live Nancy Gibbs, the famous opera singer, and Jacob Bray, a professor of philosophy whose heart, nevertheless, is in music. And who owns this quiet, sheltered corner of old England? The great Lord Ranelagh, tall, debonair, admired, sought after by the cream of London society, and engaged to Nancy Gibbs, the toast of operatic London. Now, I must tell you that at the time Jacob Bray was writing music, nobody was interested in English opera, but Jacob struggled on, ever helped and encouraged, not only by his many admiring pupils, but especially by Mary Fenton who, believe me, was quite the prettiest of all the flowers that bloomed in Jacob Bray's garden. So, let us slip back through the centuries and listen to Jacob, who at this moment is trying over one of his latest airs.
Like all artists, Jacob is hopelessly spoilt by women, and particularly by Mistress Murphy, his housekeeper. This resolute and portly person is now following him around the garden, flaunting a red flannel chest protector. It's your chest protector you'll be having, and you're not staying here without it. What do you think you are, a leprechaun? No, I don't need it, I don't need it, I tell you. I do With not. all me nursing, I've made another man of you. Ah, oh, can't you do what you're told? Now be yourself again. I'm sure you're a bad boy. You're as often as a mule. Here, look. Look what a fine show you're making of yourself. Uh, good day to you, Miss Mary. Good day to you, Professor. Professor. Listen to her. Mother of God, give me patience. And listen here to me now, you. If you go without this protector again, you can go to the devil for I wash my hands of you. And the next time you see me, it'll be at your own funeral, God forbid. <laughs> She's a goodly soul. Ah, none of your blarney. My opera, my opera, my work. Ah, she'll sure, leave all that to pretty Miss Mary. She knows all about it, and why wouldn't she, God bless her? <laughs> oh, your working rhythms all are here, Professor. But why, Mary? Because I have a surprise for you. My Lord Ranelagh is coming here this day to listen to a recital of your opera. Lord Ranelagh is coming today, Mary. Today? Oh, oh, it cannot be done. It cannot be done, Mary. Oh, but it must be done. Why, if my Lord believes in your work, he can make you famous. His word means everything. But I have no singers, no company. Well, if you will but sing me as yourself, it will suffice. Then you will have the whole tide and fashion of London town at your feet. Oh, I know every melody you've ever composed. Mm. And you taught your pupils much, unknowingly. Oh, I know. Philosophy was no good to them. It was music they wanted to waken their souls. Everybody needs music. Here. And your pupils will be here. Every student, past, present and future. How so? Peter Croy and I have been scouring all the artistic circles of Chelsea. They've all promised to come. They know your work. You taught them that in their lessons. And many have already sung at the opera. And Lord Ranelagh will come to listen. Oh, he's given his word. Oh, it will succeed. It must succeed. Listen to my word, I said. Don't go away. You'll be playing fate, I said. Maybe today. And uh, did you tell him what I composed? Delightful things that everyone knows. And then I sang a song of mine. Guess what it could be? Maybe it's a melody. We are in a love with you, my heart and I. And we are all this true, my heart and I. Did you think that? That song would have given me no chance to dance. So I chose another one.
point, Peter Crawley, one of the professor's students, comes running in to tell Christine, who is Nancy Gibbs's maid, that he has succeeded in encouraging many of the good folk of Chelsea to come and join in the rehearsal of Jacob's opera. I have raised a bout in Chelsea. I've invited all I met. And I'm pretty sure we shall see just the best ones I could get. There's an artist and his model. There's a blacksmith and his girl. There are most respected rector and a steward and collector. Then a sailor, soldier, tailor and the footman of an earl. Together we shall be a happy company. Joy and laughter in the air. This is a holiday for Chelsea. Golden sun beats everywhere, and so let's smile at every care. Today is not just another day. Today's a holiday for Chelsea. Everyone, no matter who, girls of seven, eight, boys of eighty-two, must be happy, must be gay. It's a jolly holiday. The scene is set, the play begun. Behold the actors, here they come. Oh, Peter, Peter, please. Well, it's true, Christine. They're trooping up the road in battalion. Then I must tell Miss Mary. Tell her. Beadle, who is a stout man with a rubicund face, enters with his thin short wife, followed immediately by an actor of the old tragedian type. Then a grotesque artist carrying a small canvas. Three maiden aunts, the village blacksmith and his stout wife, dairymaids, Quakers, Chelsea pensioners, sailors, soldiers, tinkers, tailors, in fact, the eternal Chelsea. Hidden amongst this colourful gathering is Lord Ranelagh, watching the proceedings with a sardonic smile, which gradually turns to one of admiration as the melodious nature of Jacob's music unfolds itself. I 
lovely voice taking the exciting high note. Nancy Gibbs, the opera singer, had joined the crowd unknown to Jacob and had carried the music to its glorious climax. Partly due to Nancy's unexpected assistance, Lord Ranella decided that perhaps after all Englishmen could write operas and that he would produce this one with Nancy in the leading role at the Haymarket Theatre. Success had come at last to Jacob Ray. later, Jacob Bray, now resplendent in his black and silver court dress, is strolling with Nancy on the balcony of her house, while inside the ballroom, crowded with London society, tongues are wagging. Have you heard the latest scandal? I never listen to scandal, Sir Percy. What is the disgusting story? Pete, it is more humorous than any dwell at the fair. Oh, I must hear this. Do you say such funny things? Now, with the pledge of secrecy, what's the story? While the Lord Wanneler has been away, Nancy Gibbs has been much occupied with her new composer, Jacob Way. Oh. Learning and reciting his music naturally. Oh, of course, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Perchance a little innocent coquetry by the lady. <laughs> innocent, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Every human being has a weakness or a vice. No, no, no. no. 
people say that vices give each life a little spice. Oh, oh, oh. Some are fond of this and some are rather fond of that. Some just think to wine or love and some prefer a chat. Now there are some people who have knowledge or have brains. Yes, yes, yes. They exchange abuse on every subject without pain. More or less. On the other hand, there is the time to draw the ten. To exchange his knowledge and his views about his friends. Views about his friends. Views about his friends. Just a little gossip, 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 nothing else but gossip, gossip, gossip. It's the same as being the song, because he's drawing. How he's drawing room. What are friends are eating, spending, thinking, how much they are earning, kissing, drinking. We know the things of love and who is who. And who is who? We get our first hand information from a very near relation of an uncle of a hatter to the king. Who gets it from a second cousin of an uncle to the cousin of his ladies who not simply everything. Just a little gossip, 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 and nothing else but gossip, gossip, gossip. He's a very good We have a kind of six or maybe six. No, no, no. We know scandal bites looks and need no evidence. Oh, oh, oh. There is one important rule that isn't hard to tell. Think the worst of everyone until you think the world. If there are two explanations for a happening. Yes, yes, yes. Never take the hardest run the bad one is the thing. More or less. Gossip is a kind of game to which we all know doubt. Must contribute just as much as those we talk about. Those we talk about. Those we talk about. Just a little gossip, gossip, gossip. Nothing else but gossip, gossip, gossip. It's the same as being the one we talk about. I'm enjoying the room. What my friends are eating, spending, thinking. How much they are earning, kissing, drinking. We know all the things that are Nancy, returning from the terrace, is about to rejoin her guests whom Jacob stops her, saying... Oh, and I have so much to explain to you, Nancy. Please, don't leave me yet. You're a strange creature, aren't you? Strange, maybe, among such artificial people. But you are different, Nancy. Don't you think we're drifting a little to where there may be no turning back? There's no turning back for me. If this work of mine succeeds tonight, may I come to you and lay everything at your feet? So many things depend on tonight. I must succeed for my own sake as well as yours. The melody must progress, Nancy. You live in music, don't you? You think in music. You dream in music. You and I are worlds apart, and yet I am so close to you. Here am I, and here's my heart, so how I not say you love me?
Height. And Mary Fenton, whom you remember as Nancy Gibbs' milliner, now comes running in, surrounded by a bevy of young gallants. Oh, gentlemen, you are much too kind. Such compliments I've not heard before. Your chattering is chattering, and I admit it's something I adore. But gentlemen, just the same, I find your compliments out of place for me. For prettiness and wittiness a thing which hardly keeps me company. What a girl! What a chance! <laughs> My love song is an old-fashioned tune. It sings of love and bluebirds in June. It meant for two, but I am alone. And yet I sing my love song to say the sky may be blue, the sky may be gray, till someone will be coming my way and dance me one day. Liable, and you over there have faithful eyes. But my poor soul is no control if all those looks and eyes could be just lies. And though it is undeniable that you over there look constant too, I frigidly and rigidly maintain not everything I think is true. How would you ever know? When my heart starts to sing, then it's so. My love song is an By now, Ranella's jealousy is thoroughly aroused, partly by idle gossip and partly by the insinuations of an old flame, the Duchess of Crewe. Methinks you've been listening to busy tongues. Faith, it will be difficult to do otherwise. There's enough gossip here to keep old London agog for weeks. What remedy do you suggest? Well, I wish it to end. No. I said tonight... I say no. Your wish is that I do not sing tonight? Well, it's a small matter while I pay the piper. And your farewell can be postponed. Your, your popularity will lose nothing by so doing. It would ruin Jacob. His whole heart and soul are wrapped up in this work. If you sing... I shall not return. This is the end, Nancy. I'm not going to be the laughing stock of London top. And so Lord Ranella departs in ill humor, and Nancy, in a dilemma, determines that she must, for Jacob's sake, sing in his opera. She calls for Mary and endeavors to show Jacob that it is Mary who is devoted slave and that she herself is only interested in his music. In her own words, Is there a higher sphere than that of a woman trying to make your dreams come true? Remember, there are still angels outside heaven. There are 
Lord Randler has fallen from his horse and is believed to be in a serious condition. Nancy decides that even though it means abandoning Jacob and his opera, she must go to her lover. She hurries out to order her carriage, leaving Mary Fenton broken-hearted. Mary realizes that this is the end of Jacob's hopes and dreams. Oh, 
Nancy, now tired for the journey, is interrupted on her way to the coach by Jacob Bray, who is full of excitement that his great moment has come and that his opera is going to be performed. The great event has arrived. If only time would stand still, so I might enjoy the moment to the full with you, Nancy. Yes, yes, indeed. Lord Ranelagh, has he returned? No, not yet. Well, then we may rejoice together. Not together, Jacob. What do you mean? We may be going different ways. How so? Oh, I know you'll never forgive me, but I see no alternative to what fate compels me to do. There will be no opera tonight. No opera? No opera? What are you saying? I shall not be there to sing your music. Are you jesting with me? No, indeed. Sad news has just been brought me. Lord Ranler has been thrown from his horse no. and lies injured some miles away. Gracious There's heaven. no one to tend him, and I'm going to him now as fast as horse can take me. You are going to him? Yes. Can't you send help for tonight? I do not know to what extent he may be injured. The message brought me was brief but urgent. Do you realize what this means? It will be the end. The vagrant is for me, for a moment. All happy moments come to an end, Jacob. And yet, so soon, so soon. If I stayed, I could not sing with any wind in my heart, and I know. It is my duty to me. It is to him, to him. And the Lord has loved me. The pain in my heart to can't feel it. Duty to him, then it's all you can see. But is there no duty to me? There is a danger, and I can't forsake it. My love dictates of your heart, but your choice, your decision, can't thrill me like a knife. 
That same night, Jacob returns to his house in Chelsea, a broken man. He's worn, tired, and dispirited. He drags himself to a seat and sings of his great disappointment. There was music in my heart. 
of all that's good are you doing out here at this hour? What about your opera? Your opera? Oh, my opera was never performed. Lord Renner was thrown from his horse and Madame Gibbs was compelled to go to him at the last moment. Jimmy, oh, there. don't talk to me. My heart is broken. Oh, my poor darling. There, there, no, there, no. Don't be upsetting yourself. It's wrong you are to be reading your heart with the light of the moon. Oh, I've seen and watched you eating your poor heart out for that gilded butterfly. May the devil skin her. Don't you know, me own child, that there'll be some fascinating women in the world it's impossible to drop with for more than a day or two. As the Shakespeare says, they're here today and gone tomorrow. But love is one of the immortals, Mr. Smurfy. Daddy, you talk about love and you only seen the shadow when the real love in all its glory was calling and waiting for you outside your very door. What do you mean, Mrs. Murphy? None other than pretty Miss Mary. Tearing her poor heart out, she is for you. Mary? Mary? Oh, impossible. She favors Peter always. Ah, a Peter, that little jack-in-the-box. Listen, Peter loves her only as he dotes on every other girl in London town. He knows, as we all know, that Miss Mary has no eyes or heartbeat for anybody in the world but yourself. Mr. Now, Smith. what do you think she's been doing here night and day? Helping you with your screeching and your bawling. You'd have had no offer at all if it hadn't been for Miss Mary. And the devil a word of thanks she'd give her. Oh, shame on you, shame. Mary could not possibly think of now, me as... Now, listen to me, light of me, light, listen. There's many a lovely girl has lost her heart to a man not half as fine as yourself. And if you were to ask me the reason why, be all the saints, I couldn't tell you. Mary, Mary in love with me. And why not? And your darling lad, God bless you. Do you know, 20 years ago, I might have set me capture myself. Oh, Mr. Smurfy. No, no, I only said I might. Uh, come on, you know, and get some sleep, and I'll make you a nice cup of pasta and some bread. Uh, this, this, what's this? Ah, uh, don't mind them. That's only that rackish mob coming home late by water from the gardens. Is Mary with them? She is not indeed. Oh, then I don't want to see them. Come Let's on, go, please. Let's go, you won't. Let's see. Where are Yes, and so Chelsea goes to bed. One by one, the lights that twinkle across the river begin to flicker out. The night watchman goes his rounds, calling the hours, telling the unheeding sleepers that all's well. The church clocks keep him company like an ethereal carillon. The deep silence of the hour before dawn covers all like a soft down quilt till the stars begin to shine less brightly and eventually pale one by one as the first flimsy flush of dawn peeps over the trees on the river bank. Gradually an all-pervading light bathes the sea. And so, so we pass to dawn. Early the next morning, Christine and Peter arrive in the courtyard while Jacob is still asleep. Is that you, Peter? Incredible as it may seem, it is me. Peter Crawley in all his well-earned glory. Uh, 
Tell me, have you heard the glad news? No. Oh, well, there'll be no other news in London town for many a day. Oh? Professor Bray's opera was a great success last night. It's on every tongue this morning. Didn't Madame Nancy Gibbs sing, after all? Nancy Gibbs? Nay. Mary Fenton the milliner filled her place at the last minute and has brought triumph for Jacob Bray's opera and herself into the bargain. Mary Fenton? Did she sing well? Well, more than well. All London town will be at her feet within two days. And at Jacob. And at mine. Yours for two? How so? How so? I let the opera from start to finish. Peter! <coughs> of a truth you did? Oh, of a truth indeed. <laughs> oh, don't make jest of me. I always have had genius. When I start to compose, I won't sing this type of old-fashioned music. I don't choose it, you don't choose it. But I'll sing a new type of music. And when I've lots of money, oh honey, oh honey, we'll go to land which are sunny. That's something we won't miss. But I can't go with you like this. My mother would never agree. Don't be afraid. Leave this to me. Each time you hope for love and its temptation, your family thinks it's a crime. So hide your tender feelings from relations, or they'll spoil them every time. That's why I thought my courting and my wooing were something I'd better conceal. But now I'm not afraid of their undoing. I'll disclose just what I feel. Oh, when I write home about them, I will have lots to tell. How I have met you, tried to forget you, till in the end I fell. When I write home about you, they will have lots to read. That your poetic and sympathetic and just the one I need. My heart is all alike and as my love is deep and strong my pen won't simply write it will compose the sweetest song. When I write home about you I will have lots to tell. When I'm confessing they'll give their blessings they understand so well. Jacob Bray, awake and dressed by now, comes down into the courtyard. He's quite unaware that his opera has been performed and therefore knows nothing of his success and the triumph that Mary has made in helping him to achieve it. But he knows now that it's Mary he loves and that Nancy Gibbs loves Lord Ranelagh. Uh, Christine, uh, Christine, uh, good morning. Have you seen Mary, I mean Mary Fenton? Oh, I hope to see her tonight. I hear she's wonderful. Yes, of course, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Peter, oh, tell me, have you seen Mary Fenton? Ah, I saw her last night, and I shall see her again tonight. She's wonderful. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, am I dreaming, or has the world gone mad? Professor Bray, the world has gone mad. What do you mean? With your success. My success? Yes. Last night, your opera was performed no. and succeeded amazingly. Today, all London town is ringing with your praises and melodies to boot. Peter, but how so I was not there? How so? A poor and humble deputy sought to retrieve the tragedy of the moment and did all that was necessary. Who could it be? Who could it be? <laughs> Have you no conjecture? Peter, of course, Peter. <laughs> you did this for me. And, and our beloved prima donna Nancy Gibbs, did she sing after all? Nancy Gibbs, nay. There was a new prima donna whose name and fame will resound to the four quarters of the globe. <laughs> And here she is. Mary! Good morrow, Professor. Ma, Mary, is it true? Peter just told me that you... True indeed. Your success has been amazing. Oh, my success. It's not to me. What of yourself? Oh, I, I sang of my best. And the audience loved me, which was quite a new experience. Oh, Mary, you are looking so wonderful. Oh, do you really think so, Jacob? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you, Jacob. Oh, I'd rather you did. Oh, I couldn't possibly do that, Jacob. Oh, uh, well, I was just thinking that 
Now you'll have so many other attractions that you and I will not be seeing much of each other. There will be no other attractions for me. I may have gained in one way, but I have lost something far more precious to me. Oh, what was that, Jacob? Mary, I... Oh, Mary. At this romantic moment, Mistress Murphy steals in and comes to Mary carrying the chest protector. She places it in Mary's hand with a little sign that it's for Jacob. Mary's embarrassed for a few seconds, and then holding the protector, shyly beckons to Jacob. He leans his head against hers and takes her in his arms. Mary places her arm round his neck while she hides the protector to his chest with the other hand. Mistress Murphy steals away again, smiling, and so we leave old Chelsea. Maybe that a love is blind and passion rude, and that my heart and I are just a fool. And yet, my darling, it's you. 